been more than a year since the referendum. Mm -hmm. How do you feel when you look back to those days? Oh, those were the, the best times of uh, my political life. I, I, I had a fantastic time during the referendum campaign. People who'd never been involved in politics, people who'd never given their stuff about politicians, uh, became interested in the political process. So 98%, 98% of the population registered to vote, 85% voted. And the people who came to vote were people who had been excluded, who had been uh, dispossessed from democracy. And they came back to have their voice heard. So it was a wonderful time, an amazing time. So I, I look back on the referendum campaign with, with great uh, pride that I was part of the process. I mean, the lessons, you know, we lost the referendum. But on the other hand, we... And during the campaign, we gained 17% of the vote, we went from 28% to 45%. And so I suppose the essential lesson is if you want to win and gain support, then you have to present a positive, inclusive, comprehensive case for independence. You have to have a, a civic nationalist case. You have to embrace all of the population. I mean, for, for example, just one example, uh, I take enormous pride in the knowledge that among the Asian community in Scotland, Asians in Scotland, there was a majority of 60% in favour of independence. Uh, so you must embrace the entire population and you must work hard and be inclusive in your arguments. And that is the essential lesson. There are things, obviously, if you look back, would I have done everything exactly the same if I'd had the knowledge of what happened? No, of course I wouldn't. But by and large, on the whole, uh, given where we started from and where we finished, I'm satisfied that we fought a, a significant campaign. After the referendum, the SNP is stronger than ever, more, more voters, more mm. uh, militants, more seats in Westminster. Mm. Uh, which is the SNP and SNP strategy for, for the near future? Well, I suppose it's onwards and upwards. I mean, the, my successor, Nicola Sturgeon, the, the First Minister of Scotland, who's very well ahead in the elections, uh, the polls for the elections this, this year, she'll be thinking of what's the best time, the best time to have another referendum. Now, Nicola is a very intelligent lady, very, she's much more cautious than I am. <laughs> That's not a bad thing. I'm, uh, uh, I'm uh, impetuous uh, by nature. So she'll be wanting to make sure that the next time the referendum is held, that the, the national cause will win. Uh, so she'll time that very carefully, and good luck to her, and I'll be supporting her, whatever she does. So there will be opportunities to have a substantial influence. Already there have been opportunities on Europe to make a difference, uh, and, uh, and we'll continue to do that. And all the time the SNP MPs will gain experience and be more streetwise and be a much more potent force in the Westminster Parliament. But remember, we have a powerful block, a powerful block of MPs How and do cannot be, Scotland can no longer be ignored. How do you see next uh, Scottish parliamentary elections in May? Which oh, on the line? The SNP will win. So um, do you think you're going to win the uh, majority of the... Uh, well, it should be said, I mean, to win a majority in a proportional system is difficult. You have the haunt here in uh, the Basque Country, you know that. But, uh, but yes, I think we, the Nicola Sturgeon will win a majority, as I did in 2001. Is there going to be in the program? Oh, well, that's a matter for, uh, for Nicola. That she, she'll decide that. And I'm sure she'll make a wise choice. But, I mean, Scotland is not the Basque Country. Scotland is not Catalonia. The Basque Country is not Catalonia. So you must understand that I... I can't uh, tell people what to do. I would make two observations. Firstly, in Ireland a long time ago, they used to have a phrase in Ireland that uh, England's difficulty was Ireland's opportunity. And I have to say, I think this uh, deadlock in Madrid is an opportunity for the Basque country, for Catalonia. So I think Madrid's difficulty it's the Basque country and Catalonia's opportunity, and you must, your politicians must uh, find a way to, to do that. Secondly, I'm interested in the overall European view of how states 
respond to democratic movements. Uh, there's a motion circulating in the Council of Europe. If a nation within a state wishes to have a, a referendum to change its status, then that should be part of the provisions of the Council of Europe. That should be part of the things that states do if a nation within a state wishes to, to change its position. Uh, now that uh, overall European democratic pressure is an interesting possibility for people in Scotland. Uh, this took 50 years, half a century of debate and argument and persuasion and articulation of a position to arrive at Westminster, arriving at that decision. These things do not happen quickly. They require persistence and, and confidence and, and stamina. But the idea of uh, when things are uncertain within the, uh, the country, as they are in Madrid just now, or London over Europe just now, when the rest of the continent says, look, we have to have rules for fair play, for democracy, for peaceful, democratic, civic movements, then these are important uh, arguments, important forces to summon. And, you know, without telling people what to do, because it's not my business, mm -hmm. uh, then these are things that should be of interest in uh, the Basque Country and in Catalonia. I'm in favour of democracy. I'm in favour of the right of self-determination. I don't tell people how to vote, but I, I say that they should be allowed to vote. They should be allowed to decide. I have the very last question. Uh, what do you think about Arnaldo Tegui's case? Uh, he's been in prison for the last yes, six years. Yes, I'm familiar with the case and I've looked at it and I'd say two things. One, one I know he was involved in peace negotiations and, uh, and the experience we've had in the United Kingdom with people involved in peace negotiations, Jerry Adams, uh, who I, I know very little, but Martin McGuinness, who is a, a friend of mine, uh, who were uh, involved in uh, the IRA in, uh, in Northern Ireland. And we found the ability, when peace was declared, that things had to be forgiven because we had a new context. And it's unfortunate that didn't happen. But what I'd also say is this, that there is no defence for terrorism. There is no defence. I mean, look, I, I know that Scotland is a different experience from other countries. I understand that, of course. And I don't preach and I don't claim we are better people. But we have been working in Scotland for a hundred years, one hundred years, like the Basque country, to establish our nationhood, devolution, decentralization, a parliament for Scotland, an assembly for Scotland, a referendum, independence for Scotland, and not a single person in 100 years has died for or against Scottish independence. Nobody has so had so much as a nosebleed. And I know countries' experience are different, but there is no justification for violence. If you have any sort of ballot box opportunity, if you have the ability to pursue your cause by persuasion, by the ballot box, by argument, then there is no. There is no, and can never be, any pretext for violence. And people who either engage in it or who sympathize with it are in a difficult position in my regard. Having said that, you know, the, the matter, I'm sure that uh, you have to consider these things individually and properly. And I also know that in the UK, people who previously were involved in violence it were forgiven as part of a peace process. And I think forgiveness of these things is also very, very important. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you.